mom and dad are much more actively religious. You know, there's like a there's a Bible in the in the foyer, and there's a Bible in dad's uh, bedside table. Um, well, or arguably they want to appear actively religious. But yes. yeah, I, I I think that I mean my intent was that they aren't super religious, but they probably still go to church. And they also probably they would feel bad if they put their Bibles away. They'd be like, oh, we need. You know, we need those to be out for us to look at, to right. consult in case we need them, yeah. or something. Um, but it's definitely, you know, I don't know, it comes from my own experience of my parents went to church and were more religious and, and stuff, and as, I don't know, around when I was like 10 or 12 or something, I just sort of like, I remember having a conscious realization of just, none of this makes any sense. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I was, like... This is all about a guy who was dead and then came back from the dead. That doesn't happen. Mm. Magic isn't real. Wow. <laughs> uh, and and it was and then there was a you know a, a a process of like being like okay well I you know I'm just not going to go to church. I also remember having a conscious realization that the only reason I wanted to go to church was because after the service they gave you free donuts. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, that's funny. Uh, and so I don't know. It's probably just partially me projecting um, and trying to show that Sam is re-examining her own values as she as she gets older and grows out of childhood and doesn't necessarily share the same beliefs that her parents do. I never tried really hard to, like, I don't know, actually, yeah, I don't know, I, it was normal church behavior, like, I would go and, like, help out with, you know, my younger siblings and, like, my parents always went to church or whatever, and would go along, and there were people, there was, like, a couple of people that I knew. It took me until I, I was about, three, yeah, I think I was like 13 or 14, I spent a significant amount of time really trying to like do the, to be like, all right, I'm going to do this church thing, I'm going to try really hard, and I, um, I would like get annoyed at people when they said, oh my god, and stuff, because I thought that was what you were supposed to do, and I think it was, I don't know, it lasted like whatever, six or eight months or something, and then I just, it broke, and I couldn't do it anymore, and I, I forget what I, I did something, uh, I, I, ruined something uh, in the church through total uh, not caring. <laughs> I, um, I, I built a, I remember now, I built a house of cards out of a um, Bible trivia um, uh, like flashcard set. Stuff? Well, yeah. it was like, it was just like Trivial Pursuit because it was Bible based. Mm. Um, and I built like this big house of cards and I, at one point, I remember thinking, all right, no, fuck it, and I glued the cards into place. <laughs> so I had this big house of cards that was glued together, <laughs> totally, like, ruining all the gun in cards. And um, at that point, uh, I stopped having to go to church so much. <laughs> Now, if I can be perfectly honest, the um, the aspects about religion in this game, I think, are one of the... I wouldn't... I think there's a lot of things about this game that you can be neutral towards, but I think uh, their handling of religion is one of the outright bad things. Again, in my opinion, but in my, bad, in my opinion, one of the outright bad things that they do, because... I don't know. Steve uh, can believe what he believes, so that doesn't really impact me. But the way he expressed it right there is, like, very uh, insulting to religious people, I'll be perfectly honest. And keep in mind, a large portion of people are religious. I know uh, in the context of this game was made, he obviously made it for a younger audience, which, even by numbers, is less religious than other areas. But still, like, there's a lot of people that are religious, and... I know that was off the top of his head, but, like, he could have phrased that better. And even um, in the implementation of the game itself, it could be handled much better. It, and then the rest of the game, it shows a very shallow understanding of religion, I'll be honest. For starters, uh, I should mention, this is actually one of my favorite details about the game. Sam keeping uh, her Bible locked in the, uh, just stuffed in the bottom of this here. That's a good example of environmental storytelling, I'll say, compared to the rest of her family. That said, uh, I'm just going to leave that off so I can talk for a little bit because I'm not sure when I'll bring it up. That said, uh, it's pretty obvious that the main reason her parents are religious is to have that conflict with their child being a homosexual. I'll just say gay for the sake of it because it's easier. Technically lesbian, but honestly, do, do the terms have to be that specific? But the point is, um, 
that honestly to me that's what it feels like there's it felt like the reason they have to be religious is so that they can have conflict with Sam about her sexuality and first I know that was much more common in the 90s than nowadays but it still feels a little stereotypical and it's what I mean by bad implementation is we don't really see how religion affects their lives I know he said it was supposed to be somewhat smaller like even he sounded like he didn't know if they go to church the only hint that they're at, that they actually do go to church is that calendar down in the lobby where it says a church potluck and apparently Steve didn't even know about that and these two bibles one here and one uh, downstairs in the foyer other than that oh and uh isn't there like oh in the book in here in the book in there that talks about um uh, that was written by a pastor and it's like a spiritual thing yeah this yeah this those four things are the only indication in like the whole game that they're religious whereas um typically i know he i understand that he's saying they're supposed to be more minor but they're not as religious as some people could be but still like there there's more signs than that it shows up more frequently than what they're suggesting and uh Again, this sort of feels like an afterthought, like it was used to justify Sam's story rather than being part of uh, Terrence and Sam's character. And also there's uh, the whole thing about misunderstanding this crucifix that I went over before. I think it shows a little bit of ignorance in terms of their understanding of different religious communities. And also, um, another aspect, which is, I wish they delved more into it, they touched upon it before, but uh, which is why I went straight from this one to the religion one. But Lonnie having a cross is, a cross necklace is something that I picked up on earlier and I found to be interesting. I feel like they could have explored that with her more if she gen like it's implied that through this that Sam's basically lost her faith. It would be more interesting if Lonnie had an actual conflict of faith within her that could have been explored because I know that's something that that's something that many people did and do go through a conflict between. Uh, the religion and what it teaches and their own personal experiences so i think they could have done more about that instead all it is is a little thing on this picture and a um and a um the upside down cross which is supposed to be oh rebellious which uh which is odd and leading into that they're just like oh a cross necklace that means catholic right no no not at all i've seen plenty of for those of, I'm sure you're familiar with just by the sound of my voice, but I'm from the South, Georgia specifically. Down here, there are not that many Catholics. More than I thought there would be, but still, in the grand scheme, not that many, especially not compared to other regions of the nation. We're, I th we're probably like the least Catholic portion of the nation. I'm willing to bet. But it's, I don't know what the dominant religion in the Pacific Northwest is. I'd probably say Catholic still has a stronger presence up there than otherwise. But the point is, the point I'm bringing that up is because um, a cross necklace does not mean Catholic. Any Christian can wear a cross necklace. I've seen plenty of Christian men and women both down here with cross necklaces. In fact, they're like regular, regularly sold in stores. If they were just a Catholic thing, you wouldn't see that because the vast majority is evangelical and Protestant. In fact, a more Catholic thing would be like, um, I don't know the specific term, but like an icon with a saint on it. Or just an actual... Icon's not the right word. I keep on making that mistake. A picture of a saint on it. Or a um, a picture of Jesus. It's usually not just a cross. That tends to be more Protestant leading. Which again, the fact that they thought that... It shows to me that they have a very... They misunderstand religion a fair bit. Which I think is problematic when... Uh, that They try to make that a portion of the conflict in the game. Oh, also, another thing about the mis misunderstanding Catholic. Again, on that picture with um, Lonnie where she's Allegra, and we'll get to that later. I'll point it out when when we do get to that. Actually, it's no, it's on the magazine downstairs. But the point is uh, to show that she's, oh, so rebellious. She has an upside-down cross necklace. Catholics don't actually see an upside-down cross as offensive. Many uh, Protestants do because the cross to them is supposed to symbolize Jesus. An upside-down crucifix to a Catholic would be. But to Catholics, an upside-down cross, not so much, because St. Peter was crucified upside-down, and Catholics tend to like St. Peter. 
for reasons that I'm not exactly going to go into. If you understand the basics, basics of, of Catholicism, which they don't, you would understand why being connected to St. Peter would be good. Anyway, I'll get back to the, back to the game. Around here, you will find some of Sam's uh, Super Nintendo cartridges that she left behind. Um, obviously, for legal reasons, we couldn't put real games in, um, and so we conscripted a few of our, our friends in the industry who are really talented artists to make uh, cool label art for fake Nintendo games that we came up with. It's so true. Um, the first one was Super Street Fire, and that was uh, by Rachel Morris, who is a cool artist. Um, who? What is it? Uh, the NYU. The um, NYU Game Center. She's done oh, yeah. a bunch of like posters and other art for for them. Um, and that. And then the next one was um, Adventurous Characters, um, which is yeah, it's sort of a. It's a it's a mascot platformer. Yeah. It's a Bubsy esque dude having cat. Oh yeah, uh, but it's a regular cat. It's not a bald cat. Yeah, it's a regular uh, cat that rides a motorcycle yeah. towards an explosion. Yeah. But yeah, Lee Petty is the art director at Double Fine and worked on Brutal Legend, and I think he he led up um, stacking. And That's yeah, awesome. he was uh, he was nice enough to spend some of his free time making the label for Adventurous The Cat Returns. Yeah. Yeah. We um. We ran into him at GDC, and he offered to help us out, and we were all like, cool. <laughs> we were like, oh, you didn't think we'd take you up on that offer, did you? Draw us a cat. <laughs> yeah. He regretted the error of his ways. Uh, and then the third one uh, is Journey of Crystal, uh, which is sort of a JRPG um, beast, uh, and that was done by uh, Jen B. Yeah. Okay. She's the art director at Supergiant, and she did pretty all of the art in... Bastion, okay. um, and is working on Transistor. I know we had some people say that they they rec- you know they they could tell that it was her mm-hmm. art because it it does it has such a signature look it's you know pretty to to how she does things. So it was really cool and really exciting to have to have uh, these really talented people from other studios that are inspirations to us uh, contribute their unique art to the game. Now that he mentions it, I can totally see that being the the artist for all those games. And it's odd that maybe this audio wasn't as recent as I thought, because he was like, she's working on Transistor now. Transistor came out a while ago. That was their second game. They've released like two or three since then. There was that uh, sports one that I can't remember. I think it had something to do with Fire. And then there's Hades, which is in sort of in development right now. I think it was released on Early Access like late last year. I could be mistaken. Either that or it was a limited time exclusive to uh, Epic Games Store last year. And it's coming out on other systems this year. Could be mistaken about that. Pyre. That's it. That, that was our third game. Pyre. But the point is Transistor was our second. So I don't know how long ago this was. They dev- Then again, I feel like Pyre was pretty recently too. Who knows? Who knows? I was uh, one of the hosts of the Idle Thumbs video game podcast for a year or two, and I you know, go on there, and every once in a while, those guys are my friends. And I didn't want to put Idle Thumbs references all over the game, but I did want to have Idle Thumbs references in the game, so we localized them entirely to this one piece of paper. Uh, so almost everything on here is an Idle Thumbs reference, and specifically to a weird exchange that we had about Will Wright's GDC talk in, like, 2008, where he didn't want everybody to show up and crowd the place, so he gave his speaker name as Phaedrus, um, and then did a talk about a bunch of crazy stuff, including the idea of rocket mail, which was going to be, like, done by the... it It was pitched by the U.S. Postal Service in the 50s and stuff. So... And, and then the thing on the podcast was about how Phaedrus had a little brother, and so anyway, whatever. The brother, of course, it's a Phaedrus, and you can't hardly see the icon in the back because it's obscured. But there's this '50s rocket icon in the back that's like the the logo of um, of Phaedrus Motors, and then also it's a a di- the reference that Will Wright was making, and that is a secondary reference here because it's a motorcycle thing. Is that in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, the book? Um, 
the author is having kind of an ongoing exchange with this this character of um, of from Greek history called Phaedrus and motorcycles and blah blah blah. So it's a big knot of obnoxious references to lots of different stupid things. Is that really all there is in here? I would have sworn there would be more, but... Okay, I'll take it. Yes, I did open it up. There's only two others downstairs that I gotta see. Two secret compartments. Not counting the last one. Almost none of the events, the little events in the game, are scripted um, as far as, like, triggering when you do something specific. So all of the thunder and lightning and the creaky noises in the house, um, they're all just randomized on timers. Um, the only like scripted, scripted thing is in the um, secret passageway when you look at the crucifix, there's scripting that detects that you did that and then it causes the light to, to pop, um, which is the, yeah my one indulgence of like messing with the player. Um, but we've had a lot of people play the game and say, you know, oh, the way you scripted it so that right when I walked into the TV room, there was that big thunder and lightning strike, like, that that was really spooky, or, or you know, I walked through that one door and then you played that sound behind me, and it's like, <laughs> it's awesome that the combination of all the different kind of, like, significant actions you can do in the game right. like crossing into a new room or opening a door or this side or the other thing and the randomization of, of stuff can make it seem like the random elements have extra significance to them but in fact it's like you just got lucky basically yeah it's total apophenia because like yeah it's just because uh, there's yeah there's enough random things going on and you can do enough things that eventually some of them are going to line up yeah. which is you know cool Now, I got this to open up in the uh, commentary list version, but I didn't figure out how. It, and it's not wanting to do it again. It's so odd. Uh, okay, the Wildfire book. Oh, man, look at this thing. Yeah, I. Uh, this was another one of those situations in which I totally felt like a weird creepo when I was doing research. <laughs> and there was a lot of uh, really horrifying romance novel covers. Uh, this poor guy um, was on somebody's Flickr account uh, that was um, allowed, that was a Creative Commons attribution licensed, um, and uh, I think he was playing volleyball or something, uh, and um, I don't know. So I, you just put suspenders yes. on him and put an axe in his hand, and now he's a fireman. Yes, I did. <laughs> it's the I best. I did it, and I will cop to it, and I do it again. Um, also, uh, as I recall, because I'm a noob, I initially picked total bondage suspenders. That's true. I, I want, I, so you had started working on it, and I went upstairs, and then I came back down. And, like, Yaron and, and I were like, you know, look, we're all like, hmm, what should we do for this and thing? I was, and I like, was like, yeah. those are fucking leather daddy suspenders. <laughs> and, what are you doing? And what I should have said is, damn it, he noticed. <laughs> Honestly, looking at it now, you can tell that's a, that's a definitely a Photoshop. And I can sort of see the soccer player. Okay, I can't do it again here for some reason, so I'll just leave it be. I really enjoyed playing Gone Home. Um, I have to say it was pretty exciting to find the Heavens to Betsy tape, you know, because that was really, I mean, those songs really did come out on a cassette tape at the time, and that really was how people discovered the music was was getting a cassette tape passed around um, so getting to put it in the actual tape player and play it and listen to our song um, it definitely gave me chills I mean it was like wow you know how exciting for a young person today to, to get that that moment of discovery um, and to listen to our music I mean it's I think it's great And real quick, we'll just see if there's a uh, one in the passage here. I'll probably say so because it, yeah, it's the most important one. Um, this is where you find the first half of Sam's locker, or I guess it's actually the second half of Sam's locker combo, as far as uh, what the piece of paper is. But um, at first, I, there were 
the, this the, the the locker combination sheet was torn into three pieces. So you had one digit um, on on each of them, and it was actually right before we sent out our our IGF build to the judges. It was the night before, and Carla came down to the basement and she was like. At three o'clock in the morning last night, I woke up in bed just being like, "Oh, we can't have it in three pieces. That's way too gamey. Well, that's that's bad. We have to fix that." And I forgot about that. And you were absolutely right. And you've had a couple of those yeah. uh, being woken up by us making a bad decision uh, kind of moments over the course of the development, and they were always um, important changes that needed to be made. Composing the ambient exploration tracks definitely ended up being the weirdest part of creating music for Gone Home. The audio diaries tended to take precedence since they had such clear criteria for completion, so the ambient tracks were the last things I did. I spent so long immersed in the logs, which were very specifically timed, uh, that to suddenly shift gears to creating these slow, standalone five-minute pieces was surprisingly difficult. I remember giving Steve a first stab at the ambient track for part two of the game, and I didn't hear anything back about it. When I eventually asked if he had any feedback, he said something like, Oh yeah, it's great. I just slowed it down by 50% and it totally works, which cracked me up uh, because I definitely didn't have that in mind. Um, but that's one of the great things about collaborative work, uh, so I just went with it. I ended up doing a number of further revisions where I'd alter elements of the original version uh, specifically to affect how the 50% slowed version would sound. It was definitely a new experience for me, writing bits of music and trying to imagine how they would sound after it's been considerably distorted. It got weirder, though. The ambient track for part one ended up being a backwards version of the slowed down part two track. And again, there were elements that sounded good at 50% slow forwards, but not at 50% slow backwards. So I, again, I went back to the original track and started altering elements so they would sound better at half speed in reverse. Um, I don't know if that's a thing ambient composers end up getting used to, but for me it definitely felt like going down the rabbit hole. If you'll give me a moment, I need to uh, go handle something real quick. Sorry, I thought I was done with interruptions for the night. Apparently not. One of the uh, larger assets that we needed for the basement to really give it character and personality was uh, a furnace. And uh, when we were initially thinking of the furnace, Steve had mentioned to me the furnace from uh, Home Alone, which if you're from, uh, if you grew up in the 90s like I did, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so I did a lot of research and uh, looked up stuff that could kind of evoke a similar feeling. And we finally settled upon octopus furnaces, which are like, um, they're thematically and um, time-wise, very appropriate. Um, they're these giant hulking monstrosities with all these arms covered in asbestos. Uh, really perfect, so we ended up modeling one of those and put it in the corner, and I think it turned out okay. Oh, man, this thing. So, two things. Uh, one, Mom's Canadian. Yay! Two, Mom didn't start out Canadian. <laughs> Um, the reason that mom is Canadian is because, uh, Kate Craig and Emily Carroll are Canadian, and early on in, um, in, in the development of the game, Emily did mom's handwriting. Um, this is before uh, she did any of the UI text or anything. Right, and it was before we decided that all the moms were going to actually be written by moms and all that kind of stuff. Integrity um, in moms. And and so uh, we had we had the um, the answering machine note in the foyer, and there what the the line well, what's the actual line that's there? It's like um, neighborhood. Right. Yeah. yeah. So so the the line on the thing is like Daniel from the old neighborhood called call him back, and we gave the text to Emily and she wrote it out longhand and gave it back to us and then I looked at it. I realized that she had inserted a U into the word neighborhood. Because it's what you do. Uh, because of being Canadian. And so to fix that bug, <laughs> instead of removing the U, I said, bug fixed. Mom is now Canadian. I picked a wall a wrong time to, oh God, to walk into the darkness. But at least now I know where that is. All right. Sorry about that. Got lost for a second. You know, there, there was kind of this um, intellectual, cross-cultural, um, like, pen pal thing that happened before the internet. You know, we used to write letters back and forth to each other about our ideas and about how we wanted to change things. And um, so a bunch of these women that I mentioned came 
up with this idea of Riot Girl, of of being a punk rocker that was also an in your face feminist. Oh, that is where it was. Okay. Sorry. That's. I'm sure I mentioned it. Will have mentioned it last episode. So there's this little scrap of of paper that's hidden under this bedside table, um, and you start to read it, and then Katie makes you stop reading it. Um, and it was this thing where it's it it's it's an exception to the interactive expectations that you have. Like it's one place, I guess, the one place where we really we really impinge on your ability as a player to do what you want and Katie intervenes basically and it, it was this it was something that I thought was an interesting little one off way of emphasizing the difference between the player and the character that they're playing as and to you as a player the note's just a note but a reminder that like Sam is Katie's sister and Katie wouldn't want to read this thing and she's not going to keep doing it even if you want her to Things like that sort of make me realize that, um, again, one of the things I respect about this game is uh, the sense of how environmentally the the game can sort of like immerse the immerse is such like a generic term in terms of describing game stuff, but uh, like, but in terms of like slowly moving the player around without them even being conscious of it. Like I mentioned earlier, Super Metroid, it is a gold mine at that. The way it subliminally does stuff like that, I really appreciate that. It is all the details in this game have made it clear that Gainer and Co. really understand that. Putback is the feature that I'm happiest with in the game. Uh, and it actually came about as sort of a little bit of an accident. Um, Playtesters had told us they didn't want to feel like some kind of horrible person rummaging around this house and tossing everything on the floor. But there wasn't really any other option initially. Um, that's all you could do was sort of try and lob things back into the place. Um, so, you know, I had done uh, some code before for placing turrets and things in other games where it, uh, you know, will arbitrarily orient an object to be perpendicular to surface and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, I told Steve that, you know, we'd have a lot of edge cases with that and it would take some time to implement. And uh, temporarily I would just give him the ability to um, put uh, objects that these things would kind of uh, stick to um, in the game. And we tried that and it worked so well that we decided to keep that. And that's uh, where Putback came from. I was really hoping they would explain what that is so I could have a definitive answer, but no. It, for all I know, he could have just been a test object for the putback system, though I feel like he would have said that out loud. There was a little bit of concern on my part before any of this got started that you never know how much liberty you're going to be given and how much over-direction you're going to get because somebody hears it like a specific, specific way and if you deviate from that at all, it, you're just going to keep doing the line over and over and over again like 50 times until it's right. So I really wasn't sure what to expect, but even on the first day getting in there and being able to go through a few of the lines and just give them what came to mind, and seeing how closely I think everyone was on the page about it. So the direction was always really positive, and it was always kind of um, coming from either additional information that changed the context of what I was reading, or a certain change in the phrasing, or the way something is being you know, a pause here, or maybe move it to here, or instead of emphasizing this word, try this one instead. So you end up with a lot of different takes that really give it a very different feeling, depending on which one you go for. I'm not sure if I will have mentioned it in the previous episode or not, but in, I was mentioning how uh, even though the game sort of doesn't directly force you into the left path, you can come upstairs first how it sort of uh, guides you that way anyways, though you can still come up here. And I sort of wonder what the story would be like if you did that, because I think you'd uh, you'd understand the conflict between uh, 
Terry and Janice a lot earlier about their struggles with their marriage. Though I think you'd be a little lost of what's going on with Sam. Sam's story is definitely supposed to be linear. I can't see you being hot, being plopped into stuff with Lonnie right off the bat because the downstairs portion or the left wing, west wing portion sort of builds that up. But uh, another thing is that you can use this button up here to sequence break the game by going down here and just skipping a crap ton of stuff. In fact, if you do that, I don't even think you need the basement key. Yeah, because you can just come, you can come up here right off the bat, hit that, go in here. Well, of course, you can say so we sequence break the game even worse than that, but just come down here and then go into the East Wing, and there you go. But uh, but the point is, um, the way they avoided having that happen is a secret for professional players, but, like, no inexperienced player would notice that. Not at all. They would because they're casually looking around for stuff to pick up, they're not going to notice a button that's barely shaded in the corner. The music for Gone Home was mainly composed over two separate periods, roughly a year apart. A version of part one of the game had to be ready by October 2012 for submission to the 2013 Independent Games Festival, so I did all the part one audio logs primarily that September. The following summer I did another round of logs for the second half of the game, as well as some part one revisions in the ambient exploration tracks. One really nice side effect of the long gap between composition sessions, as well as the structure of writing music that is very literally accompanying a story, was that I ended up hitting on pretty different ideas and approaches over time as I got further along in Sam's story. The original sketches I did had mainly electric piano sounds, which are warmer and more naturalistic than synthesizers and other electronics instruments. As Sam and Lonnie's story developed more, though, I started to bring in acoustic guitar as well. It seemed like an appropriate way for the music to build up some more familiar natural elements, somewhat echoing Sam coming into her own. Eventually, it became a really tonal element of the score. After that emerged, I started to more carefully control the instrumentation for the various main categories of log subject matter, uh, including Sam's self-reflections, Sam and Lonnie, Sam and her parents, and even Sam and Daniel. Some of those have their own melodies and themes as well. That wasn't really a grand plan from the start, and I, I don't expect everyone to really notice it, but it became one of my favorite things about working on this score. So all's wrong, there's another mention of religion here. And I guess there's also Lonnie talking about her quote-unquote psycho-Christian parent. Which, again, just sort of feeds into the fact that I think they're, uh... Again, then again, on the one hand, the kids probably wouldn't understand it too well because kids tend not to understand religion all too well. Like, being very frank. Most people don't understand religion all too well. The differences between their own faith and other beliefs, they're generally not too right about that in any case, in any generation. But this is what I mean. They just sort of uh, throw all this religion stuff here. Because before it's literally a Bible, a Bible, and uh, that's all. Oh, in the book. And then you you see a bit more around here, just so coincidentally, when Sam starts having conflict with her parents. Because it's like, it really just feels like they're just like, why is Sam having conflict with her parents? Because they're Christian. They can't just be... Um, homophobic on their own right no they have to be christian and that's it sort of irks me the wrong way like i said it just feels very it feels like a tacked on character trait it could have been much better handled even if they just wanted to emphasize that no they were religious from the get-go in more uh, obvious ways that 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 really would be fine with me it'd still be a little insulting in some cases but like i'd be i'd feel better about it but as it is executed, it feels like it was tacked on. And that that still feels insulting. Fanzines, I mean, that's one of the things that we started doing right away was doing these Riot Girl fanzines. And everyone would contribute and write, um, you know, an article for it. Um, and then we'd compile it and make these Riot Girl fanzines and we would mail them out to people. I mean, I'll, you know, all this is so funny to talk about it before the internet. But, but um you know, we used the mail, and people would write, you know, we had a P.O. box, and we started getting letters, because people would um, read in someone else's fanzine, there's this Riot girl thing that started happening, right, and um, it just, I mean, I, it was the most incredible thing, it just snowballed, it just, people just, girls wanted to be a part of it immediately across the country, Right, so from the time we started Heaven's to Betsy in 1991, I think it was only a year later, right? So one year of Riot Girl meetings and these letters happening and these fanzines happening. Well, a year later we left 
on the Riot Girl tour, the Heaven's Betsy Bratmobile Riot Girl tour, from Olympia to DC. Well, for some reason, it took us like almost five weeks to get there on this tour. And we ended up staying in DC another something like five weeks before the Riot Girl convention had happened. So that all of this, you know, all of these fanzines, all these girls across the country started getting interested in Riot Girl and the press just went bananas. I mean, the press attention was off the hook. New York Times, USA Today, all these journalists wanted information and wanted to, to interview all of us. Um, and it was, it was just, it was, yeah, it was crazy. So by the time we got to the Riot Girl convention, suddenly we were truly part of a movement. She does spell it with a U.